Good evening. My name is Tom Duncan. Tonight I will recount a brief history of Flagler County's airfields. Most are forgotten or unknown. I will also mention a few of the historic aviators who once touched down here. A more complete retelling of our local aviation history is in my book, Forgotten Flyers and Airfields of Flagler County. It is published by the Flagner Beach Historical Museum, where I am a docent and a board member. All proceeds from the sale of it go to the museum. We will begin with the airfield that we all know. It was the third and last of three airfields to be in Flagner County. Located opposite Flagner Palm Coast High School on Moody Boulevard, Flagler Executive Airport was formerly known as the Flagler County Airport. In an earlier time, it was also called the Bunnell Airport. It was rebranded to its current name in 2015 to enhance its image as more than another rural airport. Today, it is a busy county-owned and operated public airport primarily serving corporate and other general aviation uses. Today's Flagler Executive Airport occupies about 1,500 acres. It has two paved runways, one 5,500 feet long, the other 5,000 feet long. There is also a 3,000 foot long seaplane water runway on Gore Lake. A contract control tower manages the air traffic flow in and around the airport. Flagler Executive Airport originated as a Navy satellite airfield during World War II. Federal court condemned 1,145 acres of land for it in 1942. The Civil Aeronautics Administration managed its construction which began in 1943 and finished in 1944. The airfield was known variously as Bulow Naval Auxiliary Airfield or Naval Outlying Landing Field, Bulow. It was sometimes referred to using Bunnell in place of Bulow, though the National Archives files its records under Bulow. Here's a 1945 photo of a Navy fighter plane surrounded by officers and enlisted men. There were about a hundred personnel assigned to the airfield. It was active from 1944 to 1945 as a training base for the surrounding naval air stations in Daytona, Jacksonville, and DeLand. There were four paved runways, each about 5,000 feet long. This is a 1944 photo of Navy personnel at the boat landing on Gore Lake, part of the airfield property. They are standing next to the crash boat, an airboat used for water rescue and retrieval. Here is a 1952 aerial photo of the former Bulow Naval Auxiliary Airfield. That is Gore Lake in the lower left. After the war, it was in 1947 turned over to Flagner County. After it took possession of the airfield from the federal government, the county approved a two-year lease to two local Army Air Corps veterans. One was George Allen, Jr., a former B-29 Super Fortress pilot. The other was Jesse McKnight, Jr., a former B-24 Liberator pilot. Among the first big events at the new county airport was a turkey shoot. That might seem an inauspicious start for what would eventually become today's Flagler Executive Airport. You could also say it is a clever way to reduce bird strikes. The county airport became inactive as an airfield and would not come alive with aviation again until the early 1970s. 
on Saturday, February the 7th, 1948. It briefly became national news as Eastern Airlines Flight 611, bound for Miami from New York, experienced a catastrophic failure of the starboard inboard engine over the Atlantic Ocean, about 135 miles east of Brunswick, Georgia. The Lockheed Constellation carried a total of 66 passengers and crew members. As fragments of the propeller from the exploding engine chopped through the cabin, a flight steward was killed, cabin pressure lost, and control wires and cables cut. The adjacent outboard engine was damaged and failed. The plane seemed doomed to plunge into the sea. But riding as a Czech pilot that day was legendary aviator Dick Merrill, who had more commercial flying hours than anyone in the country. Together with veteran pilot William Johnson, Merrill managed in an epic feat of airmanship to fly the crippled airliner back to shore and make an emergency landing on the Flagler County Airport. Winthrop Rockefeller, grandson of Standard Oil co-founder John D. Rockefeller, was among the passengers aboard Flight 611. In this video clip, hosted by Arthur Godfrey, you will be introduced to an Eastern Airlines L-1049 Super Constellation, much like the L-649 Constellation that landed at the county airport. The Super Constellation has the same wingspan and body configuration, except the fuselage is 18 feet longer and the engines are more powerful. You will also be introduced to legendary World War I ace Eddie Rickenbacker, the Eastern Airlines president, and to Dick Merrill, the senior Eastern Airlines captain who piloted Flight 611 to a safe landing. Super Constellation, folks. 114 feet long, with a wingspan of 123 feet. Four of the latest compounded engines of 3,250 horsepower each. Do you realize how much power that is? Why, each engine has more power than a locomotive. This plane can fly up to around 400 miles an hour. And we are going to take a ride in it. Let's hear what Captain Eddie is saying. Arthur, one of those wheels always almost as much as a span. By the way, here comes your crew. Oh, hello, Dick. Hi, Dick. Hi, Captain. Hi. Hello, you. Hello, Captain. Hi, hello, you. Hello, Captain. Hi, you. Hello, Captain. Arthur, we do out of here at two o'clock. Just one hour from now. I'm ready. Well, as long as you fellas are going to do the flying, I might as well go on. <laughs> Have a good trip. So okay. long, guys. Thank you, So Captain. long. What a guy. Well, now we're going to take you on a regularly scheduled flight from New York to Miami. Only this time, you're coming up in the cockpit with us, and we're going to show you what goes on behind the scenes. Well, Hugh, how are we fixed? Everything okay, Hugh? The ship is ready, sir. 88 passengers, Captain. Gross weight 112,000 pounds. Another full load, eh? Thanks, Al. That's what I like to see. Here is a short little video about Dick Merrill's aviation exploits produced by the Virginia Aeronautical Historical Society. Dick's wife was actress and showgirl Toby Wing. In the early 20th century, the immensely popular cartoon Ripley's Believe It or Not published a booklet showcasing 50 famous flyers. Page 17 was dominated by millionaire aviator Howard Hughes. Page 18 was dedicated to an extraordinary pilot named Dick Merrill. Merrill was one of the best pilots in the country. In the 1920s, he flew the mail between Richmond, Virginia and Atlanta, Georgia in a Pitcairn mail wing. Merrill quickly proved his skill as a pilot. He flew at night when airplanes and airports had little or no lights. Other pilots often remarked that Merrill could fly in weather so bad a truck wouldn't be able to move. 
By 1930, Merrill amassed the most flight hours of any pilot in the United States and was the highest paid mail wing pilot. Six years later, Dick Merrill and millionaire Harry Richmond made the first two-way transatlantic flight in a highly modified Vaulty V-1A. Empty spaces in the plane were filled with over 41,000 ping-pong balls, so the plane would float if it ditched in the ocean. The so-called ping-pong flight also broke the record for fastest transatlantic flight. Merrill became a nationwide sensation. He hobnobbed with Hollywood celebrities and even married one. Later he flew for Eastern Airlines and became senior pilot for the company. Merrill's aviation experience was unparalleled and he was so trusted that even Dwight Eisenhower insisted Merrill be his personal pilot for his 1952 presidential campaign. When Merrill retired from Eastern, he had amassed over 36,000 hours of flight time with the airline and overall had more commercial flight time than anyone in the country. Long after his retirement and in his 70s, Merrill was still flying and breaking records. In 1966, Merrill and entertainer Arthur Godfrey flew around the world breaking 21 world records. The trip took 55 hours and 30 minutes, smashing the previous record of seven days held by Howard Hughes. By the end of his flying career, Dick Merrill flew more than 8 million miles and accumulated over 46,000 hours of total flight time. The Virginia Aviation Museum houses a Pitcairn mail wing and the only Vaulty V-1A known to exist in the world. Both planes like the ones in which Dick Merrill made history. The largely abandoned county airport occasionally served as the venue for turkey shoots and Flagler County Cracker Day festivities through the balance of the 1940s and 1950s. In 1957, it came alive with the roar of engines, squeal of tires, and smell of petrol fumes when NASCAR-sanctioned drag racing began at the old airfield. The events were hosted by the Kingsmen, a Bunnell Hot Rod Club. Drag racing continued into the early 1960s. Here is a 1958 drag racing entry permit. As you can see on this permit, racing enthusiasts often refer to the county airport as the Flagler Beach Airport. Flagler Beach once actually had an airport located east of the Intracoastal Waterway. It all began when contract airmail service started along the east coast of Florida on December the 1st, 1928. The new airmail route went from Jacksonville to Miami, right over Flagner Beach. Pitcairn Aviation had to contract and use Pitcairn mail wing biplanes to carry the mail. In the beginning, there was only one emergency airfield and refueling stop between Jacksonville and Miami. It was in a cow pasture six miles west of Melbourne. In those days, air navigation was purely by sight, using road maps and geographic features to figure out where you were at any given time in flight. Here is a photo of a Pitcairn mail wing forced down by fog in Flagner Beach on Ocean Shore Boulevard, today's State Road A1A, about two miles north of Moody Boulevard. This was only four days after the new airmail service started. The plane flipped over when the right wheel went into soft sand on the road shoulder with minor damage and no injury to the pilot. After the forced landing of the mail plane, Flagler Beach Mayor and founder George Moody advocated that an airfield be built in the town. No doubt the mayor had in mind that an airfield would bring tourists and potential land buyers to his little village by the sea. 
After all, George was Flagner Beach's very first land developer. It was perfect timing, as the Department of Commerce sent Captain William Seth Kenyon to Florida in early 1929. His task was to survey the East Coast for sites where new emergency airfields and airway beacon light towers might be located to enable nighttime airmail service. When he met with the Flagler Beach mayor and other town leaders, a commitment was made for the town to build an airfield. The town also promised a place for the federal government to erect a beacon tower. Here is a photo of the Flagner Beach Airport circa 1930. Construction began in September 1929 and completed in January 1930. You can see the Fuquay Mansion, today's Topaz Motel, in the upper center of the photo. The original airport occupied about 20 acres between today's South 12th and South 14th Streets. It was bordered on the east by Daytona Avenue and extended a block west of today's Flagler Avenue on land leased to the town by George Moody, Dana Fuquay, and Luther Upson. The new Flagler Beach Airway Beacon Light was first turned on at sunset on February the 12th, 1930. It sat atop a 51-foot steel tower located near the northeast corner of the airfield. According to Catherine Wilson, the Beacon Tower was sited on land donated by Luther Upson, where today is the south parking lot of the community church on the east side of Daytona Avenue. Here is a 1931 Department of Commerce Airway route map. Flagler Beach is unnamed on this map, but shows up by its airway beacon number 26. The Flagler Beach Airport was expanded in 1934 to about 300 acres by the addition of marshlands on the west. Federal relief agencies provided funds and labor to construct two new runways approximately 3,000 feet long using sand and shell spoil from the Army Corps of Engineers contract dredge that was widening and deepening the Entracoastal Waterway at the time. The Beach Airport appeared in federal aeronautical charts such as this 1935 sectional chart. Indicated features were a rotating airway light beacon, number 26, with course lights flashing a dash dot dash beacon ID code. It was marked as an auxiliary airfield, meaning anyone could use it without charge at their own risk. It also meant that there were no passenger or aircraft repair facilities available on the field. The Flagler Beach Airport was one of six Florida airfields featured in a 1937 Works Progress Administration publication entitled America Spreads Her Wings. It extolled the role of federal relief agencies in improving aviation facilities and noted that the airport was used by many famous flyers and sportsmen. When the United States entered World War II after the Pearl Harbor attack, neither the Army nor the Navy had sufficient assets to conduct anti-submarine patrols. The country relied on the Civil Air Patrol to take on this mission. In the fall of 1942, the Navy took over the Daytona Beach Municipal Airport to make it into a naval air station. That forced the Civil Air Patrol to relocate Coastal Patrol Base 5 to the Flagler Beach Airport. The town leased the airport to the Civil Air Patrol. Coastal Patrol Base 5 started operations at the Flagler Beach Airport beginning on October the 28th, 1942. Known as the Flying Washing Machines, Planes from the base flew from dawn to dusk up to 60 miles offshore. 
The patrol area covered the nearly 200 miles of coast from Jacksonville to Melbourne. After the Navy took over anti-submarine missions, Base 5 closed on August the 31st, 1943. As part of its lease with the Civil Air Patrol, the town of Flagner Beach agreed to build a main operations building at the airport, shown here. On the second floor is the radio shack, topped by weather station instruments. Here is the interior of the radio shack. And here is the Base 5 hangar, also provided by the town. Base 5 officers are lined up for a formal photo here in front of the headquarters building at the Flagler Beach Airport. 127 men and women served at Coastal Patrol Base 5. As founded, the Civil Air Patrol was a gender and racially diverse organization. However, women were excluded from the Coastal Patrol flights because it was considered too hazardous. On August the 31st, 1943, its final day of operations, Base 5 celebrated with a party. They even invited the Navy. This 1943 aerial photo shows the beach airport at a time when it was occupied by Coastal Patrol Base 5. The last recorded flight from the beach airport was in 1945. Despite concerted efforts by the town to lease it as an airfield to government or private enterprise, there were no viable takers. Beginning in 1945, the town began selling all peripheral buildings that were erected while Coastal Patrol Base 5 was active. In 1947 and 1948, the town auctioned off the administration building and hangar. That was followed by the sale of the airport property in 1949. Though it has been 75 years since the beach airport was active, you can still see vestiges of the old airport runways in the salt marsh of the intercoastal waterway. I took this aerial photo during the November 2018 Freedom Fest while riding in a vintage Waco biplane. Those rectangular light green areas are the phantom remnants of the airfield. There were more than a half dozen famous flyers verified to have used the beach airport. The most famous was Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh. Local lore and mythology claim several other famous flyers came here as well. Topping that list was Amelia Earhart, but there is not a shred of verifiable evidence that it really happened. I will introduce you to just a couple of those famous flyers. The first was Randy Enslow, who was piloting a Fairchild 71 monoplane shown here in a generic file photo. It was carrying 1,000 pounds of New York newspapers to Miami and ran into strong headwinds, making a forced landing at the Flagner Beach Airport on Saturday, January 18, 1930. That was less than three weeks after the airport officially opened. Randy Enslow was a friend of Charles Lindbergh. They had barnstormed together from St. Louis in 1924 using Enslow's J-1 standard biplane. Enslow was nationally known for a series of flying articles that appeared in Popular Science magazine from 1929 to 1932. Arriving at Flagler Beach Airport on Thanksgiving Day, November the 26th, 1931, were two nationally known husband and wife aviators, Oki and Martha Bevins. They came to establish a new winter flying school at the beach airport. This photo of Oki and Martha was taken at Lunkin Airport in Cincinnati, Ohio. Oki Bevins was a flying buddy of John Paul Riddle, 
who co-founded the Embry-Riddle Company, forerunner of today's Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, headquartered at Daytona Beach. He was hired by the Embry-Riddle Company at Lunkin Airport in Cincinnati, Ohio, as one of the two original airmail pilots to fly the Chicago to Cincinnati contract route with an intermediate stop at Indianapolis. This route had some of the worst weather of any in the country. As assistant air operations officer at Embry-Riddle in Cincinnati, Oki got to know Charles Lindbergh quite well. Lindbergh frequently stopped in to visit with Riddle and his staff on his way elsewhere. Martha Bevins was the first woman student pilot at Embry-Riddle. It is where she met Oki. He was by then the assistant air operations officer and a flying instructor at Embry-Riddle. They fell in love and married in 1928. Like Amelia Earhart, Martha would go on to earn her air transport rating, the highest level of pilot certification. She was also Cincinnati's first licensed female aviator. Martha was first introduced to Charles Lindbergh when he came to Cincinnati with the Spirit of St. Louis in August 1927 as part of a national tour. That was three months after his famed solo transatlantic flight. When he let her sit at the controls of his plane, the newspapers speculated that Lindbergh was smitten by the attractive young aviation student. In this 1934 Aerodigest ad by the Aeronautical Corporation of America, known generally as Aronka, you can see the Bevins and their dog named Strut in front of the little Aronka Model C3 they used as a primary trainer at Flagler Beach. The Bevins operated their beach airport flying school for three winter seasons from 1931 to 1934. Flagler Beach and its airport made international news when Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh, the most famous aviator in the world, made a forced landing here on Saturday, November the 28th, 1931. He encountered dense fog just north of town when flying along the coast from Miami, so he turned around and landed at the little beachside airfield he had observed in passing. This is a photo of Lindbergh standing in front of his borrowed Douglas O-25C Army Observation Biplane on the beach airport. Local citizens surround Lindbergh's plane at the Flagler Beach Airport in this photo. Lindbergh was cordial to them. He stood for photos and gave out autographs. Lindbergh was shocked when Oki and Martha Bevins met him after landing here. He never expected to encounter two aviators he already knew in this little seaside airstrip. He was delighted to make a couple of stunt flights in the little Aronka monoplane that the Bevins used for primary flight instruction. They then walked him over to the Flagler Beach Hotel where he had his second breakfast of the day. Lindbergh took a room in the hotel across the hall from the Bevins, who had arrived here only two days before. Lindbergh spent Saturday afternoon relaxing on the beach with the Bevins, Dana Fuqua, and John Upson. After dinner, he went fishing with his Flagler Beach hotel host. Sunday was another day at the beach. In these two photos, Lindbergh is with Clarence Toller, chief of the Flagler Beach Coast Guard Station. After his forced weekend vacation in Flagler Beach, weather cleared sufficiently on Monday morning for Lindbergh to resume his flight home to New York. Oki Bevins helped him pre-flight his plane, then he took off, dipping his wings in tribute as he passed over town. Though brief, it was Lindbergh's first and only Florida vacation. He stated a desire to return, but there is no evidence that he ever did. Only five months later, his baby boy was kidnapped and killed. Martha Bevins typed a letter to her parents about Colonel Lindbergh's visit on the day he left Flagner Beach. 
In her letter, she stated that he nearly wept on having to go, being vastly fond of the surf and the quiet and strut and oaky and the Aronka, which he flew whenever he could. Strut was the Bevan's Boston Terrier. There is much more that I do not have time to cover here, especially about the flyers who use the beach airport, but I would like to encourage anyone interested in our local aviation history to visit us at the Flagler Beach Historical Museum during our November aviation days. We are almost done, but for completeness, I need to briefly touch on the second airport that came to Flagler County, located within the town limits of southeastern Bunnell. Federal relief agencies funded its construction at the end of 1933 on about 100 acres of land. It was a grass airfield about 300 feet wide and 2,000 feet long. Oki and Martha Bevins, who ran the flying school in Flagner Beach, were the first to land on the new airfield. You can see the airfield with the standard runway centerline marking in this 1943 aerial photo. The airport was in the southeast quadrant formed by the intersection of Moody Boulevard and State Street, near where the Bunnell General Hospital would be in the future. That was most recently the site of the Flagner County Sheriff's Operations Center, vacated as a sick building and sold by the county. Both the Bunnell and Flagner Beach airports were marked on this 1935 State Road Department map. In 1937, an air circus came to the Bunnell Airport. The main attraction was passenger flights on a giant Stinson trimotor piloted by Doc Dockery. Dockery was an easygoing, Texas-born, barnstorming and pioneering crop dusting pilot. He held a world record for dead stick landings. He was also the flight instructor for Wiley Post, who won fame in 1933 for making the first solo around the world flight. This photo shows George Allen Jr.'s Fairchild PT-19 World War II surplus primary trainer on the Bunnell Airport in the late 1940s. The Bunnell Airport no longer existed at the time of this 1970 aerial photo. Gloria McCarn Dean recalls that her uncle George Allen flew her from this airport to Tallahassee to attend Florida State University during the period between 1958 and 1962. So the airport may have been operational as late as the early 1960s. The municipal airports at Flagner Beach and Bunnell were born in the Depression era both became extinct around the mid-century. Flagler County's aviation future lay in the World War II Naval Auxiliary Airfield, constructed approximately midway between the two towns. It was a paved, rather than grass, airfield, unlike its predecessors, and the runways were thousands of feet longer. With the great number of military airfields in Northeast Florida available for peacetime transition after the war, there was just not a sufficient business case to support three airfields in the county. Even then, it was decades after the war before the surviving airport resumed routine air operations. That concludes the presentation. Thank you for your kind attention.